Father, we long for the day when we too will attain to the resurrection of the dead. And Lord, we tell ourselves that now in this life, in this body, because we know that this life and this body is not all that you have for us, not any more than the body that Jesus took on, the flesh he took on was the ultimate that you had for him. But resurrection must happen, and it will happen. As sure as Jesus was raised from the dead, so shall we. Oh, Lord, we long for that day, for you to get all of your promises fulfilled, for you to be glorified in all of those promises fulfilled, for you to be glorified in Jesus, the resurrected Son of God, our Savior. It's in his great name we pray, amen. Please be seated. If you do not have a Bible but would like to have one this morning, these guys are going to make their way up the two, three aisles. And just put your hand up in the air and make sure that they don't pass you by until you are able to get one. And let's take our Bibles and open them up to Matthew chapter 28. The passage we read this morning earlier in our worship is the one that we will be in as we consider the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're going to use Matthew's account. He will guide us. As you're turning to Matthew 28... Just to remind you, we are in the city of Jerusalem, and we need to reacquaint ourselves with the burial of Jesus. So even just a few verses back in chapter 27, verse 57, Matthew says this, when it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. And this man went to Pilate, who was the governor, and he asked for the body of Jesus, and then Pilate ordered the body of Jesus to be given to Joseph. And Joseph took the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and he laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. And then Joseph, with others, would have had to have somebody help him roll a large stone against the entrance of the tomb, and he went away. But while all that was going on, two women at least were watching. Mary Magdalene, verse 61, was there, and the other Mary, sitting opposite the grave. That's the account of the burial of Jesus. But meanwhile, in the temple in Jerusalem, the religious leadership of the temple was plotting and scheming. They were resolutely set against any resurrection. They didn't believe in such a thing that it would even happen, but they can't even run the risk of even a fake resurrection taking place that would be pulled off by the disciples of Jesus. And so this is their plan, verse 62 of chapter 27. On the next day, the day after the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate, the governor, and they said, sir, we remember that when Jesus was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I am to rise again. Therefore, give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal him away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead, and the last deception will be worse than the first. So Pilate said to them, you have a guard. That doesn't mean you have one guard. That means you have a guard of soldiers. There's probably about a dozen of them. Go and make the grave as secure as you know how. And they went and made the grave secure and along with the guard, they set a seal on the stone. And that's where Matthew 27 leaves us. A secured tomb, a guarded tomb, and a filled tomb. A tomb with a dead body in it. And at some point, between verse 66 of chapter 27 and verse 1 of chapter 28, everything changed. Matthew 28 is God's account through Matthew of the tomb that is now already empty. And the empty tomb triggers five episodes. Jesus is no longer in the tomb, and that triggers a succession or a progression of episodes or scenes that are to be examined with the empty tomb right behind them. In other words, when you look at each one of these episodes that we'll look at in a moment, the empty tomb, you should think, the empty tomb triggered this. 
That's what we get to plunge into this morning. And there's an added benefit for us. There's so much in this chapter that helps a believer in Jesus Christ just understand what it is to be a disciple, what kind of disciples we are, and what life is like as we try to live out the mission of Jesus Christ on this planet until he comes back. We get to help this, have this help us shape our worldview, the way that we view the world we live in. So what is this passage all about? I'll put it for you up on the screen. The empty tomb of Jesus triggered five episodes which inform the believer's worldview. Number one, here's the first episode. The empty tomb and the powerful angel. Verse one. Now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. The two Marys have returned, at least these two. They had watched Joseph of Arimathea prepare Jesus' body, and they have returned to look at the grave, to observe it. They saw the stone rolled in front of it, and they're wondering, how on earth are we going to move that and get to the body and finish the burial preparation? But then the surprise of their life comes, verse 2, and behold... A severe earthquake had occurred. An angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat on it. Heaven crashed down onto the handiwork of the temple's religious leadership and the guard, the Roman soldiers at the tomb. An angel descended. The angel quaked the earth. The large round stone door rolled and fell over, and in victory, the angel sat on it. When I was a little kid, my older sister was bigger than me almost all the way through high school. It's really sad. It says more about me than it says about her. And she used to sit on me. It's the kind of sitting where, like, your arms are at your side, and you, you can't... I was just helpless. And she sat there in victory over me nearly every day. This is the angel on the rock. Rock was no problem at all. Sitting in victory. Verse 3, and his appearance was like lightning. His clothing as white as snow. The appearance of the angel was a supernatural brilliance. An unearthly brilliance. Supernatural purity. What's the point here? An unearthly and untarnished by the world being invaded the guard's domain. And without any regard for them, just unsealed what they sealed and guarded. And they sealed it the best way they knew how. Verse 4, the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The guards, that means there's about up to a dozen of them, Actually, they became unconscious at some point and rigid for a time like a dead body. And so grasp this. The only thing that looked dead at the tomb of Jesus was the soldiers. Look, what happened here was not a small band of disciples that came early in the morning to try to steal the body. The, the, the soldiers would not have feared them in the least. This was a being that they had never encountered before in their lives, and they were terrified. Verse 5, the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. The angel turns to speak to the women who have come upon the scene. Can you imagine coming upon this scene? Maybe as the women drew closer, they, they heard, or maybe they even felt the earthquake The stone is rolled away, and some kind of a lightning being is sitting on it, and Roman soldiers are lying stiff on the ground, catatonic. These women don't come upon an episode like that every day. They need help, and so the angel turns to them and says, do not be afraid. Don't be afraid like these soldiers lying on the ground, terrified. The angel was A-OK, terrifying them. But he doesn't want the women terrified, the disciples. He speaks to calm them. Verse 5, he knew why they were there. For I know that you are looking for a Jesus who has been crucified. 
You see, this is why the women have come back. They have not come back because they expected the resurrection of Jesus and they wanted to confirm the empty tomb. They didn't come back and say, hey, soldiers, I think you need to undo the seal and roll this back to see what's not inside. They believed the tomb would hold a body, but they discover by the angel that he is not here, verse 6, for he has risen just as he said. Listen, there is no one on earth this morning, there is no human on earth who is prepared for this. There is no one on earth that God could turn to to say, go roll the door open and show everybody. He's not there. That's why a being from heaven had to come. And just to make it clear, the angel did not come in order to let poor Jesus out. But somehow inside the cave, he was able to get out of the wrappings, but he wasn't strong enough to get the stone rolled away. Jesus already, prior to the angel even coming, silently, mysteriously, gloriously, powerfully, and without any regard for science, left the tomb. The angel was not there to free Jesus, but to let frail disciples in. The angel invited them to come even closer with their own eyes and see that he was not there, verse 6. Come, see the place where he was lying. But notice what the visitor from heaven finishes with, verse 7. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. You see, the empty tomb is not a destination. The empty tomb is not a cul-de-sac. It is a launching pad. It is a starting line for a race. And you'll see that at the end of the chapter as well. But the women are not to remain there in wonder. They're not to remain there in astonishment. They are not to remain there and speculate together on what exactly happened. But they are to run and they are to spread the good news of the resurrected Messiah to the rest of the disciples. Verse 7, he says, He is going ahead of you into Galilee, and there you will see him. Behold, I have told you. Jesus, remember all of this is in Jerusalem. Jesus is not interested in heading back into the temple to prove everyone wrong there. He's done with the temple. The veil was torn from the top to the bottom when he was crucified and gave up his life. The temple is over. And it's not enough that disciples of Jesus just see an empty tomb, or it's not just enough that they just believe and take the word of the women disciples, but they actually must go to a certain mountain that he designated, and they must see him themselves. And so here is the first episode. When you look at this first immediate episode, you are to think of an empty tomb that triggered this powerful angel. What difference does this make on our thinking even today? Think on this. It takes heaven on this first morning. It takes heaven. It takes a heavenly being to invade the graveside to reveal the resurrection. No disciples came forward early in the morning demanding the soldiers to open up the tomb in order to prove that there was no body inside. Listen, the resurrection of Jesus, even though he said he was going to rise from the dead, was so counterintuitive, no one on earth was prepared for it. Nobody on earth even believed it. A visitor from heaven had to come and convince disciples that he wasn't dead. That tells you how unbelievable the resurrection is apart from God. Help from heaven must come even today to help you grasp what Jesus Christ did. The empty tomb triggered this second episode. Number two, the empty tomb and the obedient women, verses 8 to 10. With the command of the powerful angel and the obedient women, they, they, they took off running, verse 8. They left the tomb quickly and with, great, uh, with fear and great joy, and, and they ran to report it to his disciples. The, the fear had not completely left them. 
but fear was now being displaced from their hearts by something else as they ran. Joy began welling up within them, great joy. And so whatever the angel said was helpful, it was successful, and they are running, and their adrenaline is pumping, and as they're running, they're beginning to connect dots in their minds of what Jesus had been telling them for three years, and it's beginning to come true. It's true. He's not dead. He's alive. And behold, verse 9, Jesus met them at that moment, and he greeted them. It's just a simple greeting. It's just what anybody would say to anybody else on a path that morning, greetings. So, like, common in his mind, of course I said I was going to do this. Of course I would be here now. He met them, and they came up, and they took hold of his feet, and they worshiped him. The obedient women who were running were primed and ready for worship of Jesus, And listen, you need to understand this morning that really this is the center of everything. This is the center of Christianity. This is the center of biblical salvation, that we worship resurrected Jesus, period. It's not about Christian things. It's not about Christian culture. It's not about evangelical culture or what anybody puts together. Ultimately, at the end of the day, at the beginning of the day, at the middle of the day, through all of it, life is about grabbing his feet and worshiping him in humility. Is that you? Not asking if you go to church, not asking if you think the Bible is true, I'm not asking if you try to not do the kinds of things you're not supposed to do and do the things you're supposed to do. That, some of those things are very, very important. But I'm asking, do you worship Jesus Christ? He's raised from the dead. Not asking if you revere a historical figure that you think might have once lived long ago. He is raised from the dead. Do you worship him? Jesus had instruction for them as well. Verse 10, do not be afraid. Now it is the time for all remaining traces of fear to be gone for the women, for good. And Jesus affirms the angel's message to go to the disciples, verse 10. Go and take word, now watch this. Go and take word to my brethren. Tell them to leave for Galilee. Let's get out of Jerusalem. Let's go back to no man's land. Do you see how tender Jesus is toward his disciples by calling them my brethren? He, he, he doesn't say, go tell my slaves. Go tell my servants. What humility in Jesus that he would lower himself to the status of a brother. I mean, look down at verse 18. You know this. This is the same guy. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. That one humbled himself to the point of these disciples and said, I just want to be like a brother to them. They're my brothers. And think of of how highly he thought of them. What had they just been? Runners, scared, deniers. But he thinks so much higher of them than that. He thinks of them as his brothers. And don't miss this again. He makes it clear. And there they will see me, verse 10. He wants more than just them to take the word of the women that he's alive. He wants to be seen by them. They must become witnesses of his resurrection. Now, I don't know if you've thought of this, but why didn't Jesus just show up at the tomb with the angel for the women? Why didn't he just show up there? Why wait for this moment? I think there's something here for us. His resurrection required action. The angel told the ladies to go quickly, and they did, and they ran. Again, an empty tomb, his empty tomb, is not a cul-de-sac. It's not a finish line. It's a starting line. It's a launching pad. And so they ran. And when did Jesus appear to them? When they obeyed, even in the simplest way. When they obeyed the simple command to go to the disciples. And Jesus rewarded their simple obedience with his presence. They were the first to worship the risen Christ. 
Now, now we're going to get to more of this soon, but the resurrected Jesus, the, the empty tomb requires action. That's Matthew's account. To run quickly with the news. And Jesus rewards that simple obedience with his presence, even to the end of the age. When you see the obedient woman, you should think of the empty tomb that triggered their obedience. The next episode triggered by the empty tomb is really a sad episode. Notice thirdly, number three, the empty tomb and the lingering lie. Verse 11 says, while they were on their way, meaning the women, while the women were on their way to tell the disciples, some of the guard came into the city. And again, there would have been about 12 soldiers or so guarding the tomb in shifts. And not all of them left. Some of them came back, not to Pilate, their boss, but to the temple religious leadership. Remember, they were on loan from Pilate to the religious, religious leadership of the temple back in Matthew 27, verse 62. And they didn't run to Pilate. If they had, they would have been executed for failing to keep the body of Jesus in the tomb. Think on that. How would you like to be charged with keeping the body of Jesus in the tomb? You talk about being set up for failure. So instead, they came to the religious leadership of the temple because they had far less to fear in going to them. Verse 12 it was a heavy-duty thing that they just heard, and so the religious leadership gathered all of the, their wise men together while they were, um, and when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they came up with a plan. What's their response? We were wrong. We were so wrong. We're, we're the leaders of God's house. We're the leaders of the temple. What did we do? That's not what they did. That's not what they did at all. Their response was to bribe the guards, verse 12. They gave a large sum of money to the soldiers. The stewards of God's temple made up a lie, verse 13. You guys need to say this. His disciples came by night and stole him away while, while we were sleeping. Tell that lie, that lie along with the news that he's been resurrected so that clouds it all. And the religious leadership of God's temple showed more concern for the welfare of the soldiers than they ever did for the welfare of Jesus. Verse 14, and if this should come to the governor's ears, we'll win him over, we'll keep you out of trouble. Could it be any clearer that God and his temple, God and his, the religious leadership of his temple are completely at odds with each other, enemies of one another. Uh, Messiah had just shed his blood on the cross as a substitute to atone for the sin of those who trust in him. Messiah was raised from the dead, and that confirmed every scripture that the religious leadership of the temple was supposed to be teaching to the nation of Israel. And what does the religious leadership of the temple do? They propagate a lie alongside the truth of the resurrection. There was nothing else that they could do in their minds. I mean, how were they going to explain the empty tomb without at the same time admitting the resurrection? They just had to make up a lie. And by the way, the disciples were in no condition to leave their scared little place, come face a dozen soldiers, and steal the body away from them. And they took the money, verse 15, and they did as they had been instructed, and the story was widely spread among the Jews and, and is to this day. Matthew writes nearly 30 years later, and 30 years later, there's two stories going forth. Jesus was raised from the dead. No, his disciples stole the body. And here's what's helpful for us today. If if you ever grow disheartened by the fact that so many lies exist in the world alongside the truth of Jesus, if you ever grow discouraged that there are false and competing messages about Jesus that actually demean him, that slander him, that mock him, just know that it has always been this way since the morning the tomb was opened. And God knows it. And God isn't thwarted by it at all. 
Lies run the course of the land, and so do we with the gospel. Focus more keenly, more acutely on the truth of the gospel. Be faithful to keep preaching. The lies don't hinder God from achieving his gospel purposes in the lives of those that he saves. The soldiers didn't hinder God from doing what he was going to do with his son. Jesus wasn't hindered from leaving the tomb by the soldiers. Neither is Jesus hindered by any lies that are being told about him. Remember that. When you think of this episode, know the empty tomb triggered it, which leads to the next episode triggered by the empty tomb. Number four, the empty tomb and the erratic disciples, verses 16 and 17. But the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee and to the mountain which Jesus had designated. We don't know which one it was, but they did. And they listened to the message of the women when they came to them, and that was very good. But then notice what happens when they finally see Jesus, verse 17. When they saw him, they worshiped. But some were doubtful. It's difficult for those two things to coexist at the same time, worship and doubt. difficult for worship to exist where doubt is. It's difficult for doubt to exist where worship is because worship dispels doubt, and, but if doubt is there, doubt dispels worship, except in the group of disciples that Jesus had. What a bunch. They are an erratic group. Over here are some worshipers, and right next to them, some doubters, and that's just the story, right? That's what we've seen. What brutal honesty in the Bible. For us. No rosy picture painted here of some amazing Captain America type heroes. But with a group like this, how will anything the Messiah wants to accomplish in this world ever get done? Lies are being spread about him. Soldiers guard his tomb. Erratic disciples take his message. What's the, what's the truth here? What's, what's, the, what's the reality? The reality is this, the work that Jesus has for us to do doesn't ultimately rest on us being unwavering disciples, being qualified, steadfast disciples. We need to be, we won't be, but his work ultimately rests on him. So when you see an erratic group of disciples like this on the page or when you look across this room and you see some erratic disciples like us, just remember, it all rests on him. The empty tomb triggered this moment and Jesus isn't hindered at all by soldiers. He's not hindered by lies. He's not even hindered by erratic disciples like us which takes us to the last episode triggered by the empty tomb. Number five, the empty tomb and the kingly commission. Remember, you need to see each one of these episodes with the empty tomb not far behind each one, and especially this one. The great commission should not be thought of as some kind of distant task removed and disconnected from the empty tomb. Matthew didn't present it to us that way at all. If the women on the first morning had to run from the tomb with a message, how much more so must we continue to run from the empty tomb into the nations? Now, what I want you to do, these are very familiar verses, but I want to look first with you what Jesus says about himself in these very familiar verses. Look at verse 18. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. That means Jesus has total freedom to do his will anytime he wants, anywhere he wants, in all of the universe and even in heaven. All authority is his. It has been given to him. Pilate's authority is under his authority. The religious leadership's uh, authority in the temple is under him. The Roman soldiers at the stone are under his authority. No one can thwart his power. He can do what he wants whenever he wants. He's free to do it. Now go to the end of verse 20. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus has the ability outside the tomb to be with his erratic disciples all the time, 
all the way across the world, all the way to the end of time. Do you understand that? This chapter, from the empty tomb, a line was drawn all the way to the end of the age. And what you need to think of when you think of Jesus out of the tomb is you need to think of an all-powerful king. All authority has been given to him. And you need to think of an ever-present king who will be with us all the way to the end. And that is what sandwiches the Great Commission. The main verb in verse 19 of the Great Commission, you know this, is not go, but it's make disciples. Now, how on earth do erratic disciples like this make disciples, and do we want them to be doing that? Well, obviously, it doesn't rely ultimately on them. Obviously, the only way erratic disciples can make more disciples is by the power of the king as he is present to the end of the age with them as they run. We can do what he commands us to do, not because we've got it, but we can do what he commands us to do because he's king and he has all power and he is ever present with us on the great commission. So how do we make disciples? We don't set up shop at the empty tomb and hand out pamphlets It's not a cul-de-sac. We don't invite the world to the empty tomb. We run from the empty tomb into the nations. We must go, therefore, and make disciples. We are to run from the empty tomb, keeping the empty tomb in our minds as we go. Jesus came out all-powerful, ever-present as my king. Through the preaching of the gospel, how do we make disciples? by baptizing them when they believe the gospel, when they repent of their sin and turn towards Christ, trusting in him and in him alone to be saved, we baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We help them make their first public profession of loyalty to Jesus by being baptized, by going all the way underwater, signifying identity with Christ in his death, and then coming all the way out, signifying an identity with Christ in his resurrection. We help them to publicly proclaim that identity with Jesus Christ crucified and Jesus Christ raised from the dead. And we help them to publicly identify themselves with a group of erratic disciples like this. There's nothing private about the Christian life. There's nothing private about following Jesus. I can remember when I got saved in my little hometown and my high school, I didn't know any other Christians. But when I got saved, I remember talking to some of them that I found out who said they were Christians. And I remember saying to one of them, why didn't you ever tell me? And he kind of looked around and he said, I'm, I'm kind of one of those undercover Christians. And I was a brand new believer. And I, was, I, was, I just remember thinking, that sounds so wrong. And it is. There's no such thing as a private Christian. Not even the thief on the cross on the, as he's crying out in his final breaths, he's willing to identify publicly with Jesus. Now, what did Jesus say? With me today in paradise. How do we make disciples? By teaching them to observe all that I commanded. Is Jesus interested in obedience? The, <laughs> actually, yes. The king with all authority in heaven and on earth expects obedience. And we are to be a people, a bunch of erratic disciples who help train each other how to obey. We don't just teach the commands. We are to teach them to observe the commands, teach them to obey the commands. So obedience to Jesus is something that we're helping each other with all the way to the end. How do we do that? We can't do it without the all-powerful king. We can't do it without the ever-present king. Matthew could not present the Great Commission without the empty tomb as that which triggered the Great Commission. We must incorporate more of this kind of thinking even into our own evangelism each day. Think on this. An empty tomb is just behind you as you're sharing the gospel. Think that way. An all-powerful king is out and an ever-present king is with you as you open your mouth to your children, as you teach your kids, as you share with the person in line at the store. 
everything we are as a church, everything you are as an individual disciple of Jesus, everything we do from this nation to all of the other nations for the sake of the gospel flows from the empty tomb. Jesus left that tomb as the all-powerful king, as the ever-present king. Do you know him? Do you worship him? Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ? Are you trusting in him alone to be right with God? To have your sins taken away from the sight of a holy God who must punish sin and will punish all sin? Do you understand that Jesus was crushed on the cross in the place of those who do trust him? And they have to fear no more condemnation because Christ took all of it in their place. Do you understand that he will declare over you a, a status of righteousness that, that's not yours, that you didn't earn, that you didn't muster up on your own ability, but his righteousness, he'll just declare it over you on the basis of faith alone. And nothing you do does that. Faith alone in him is what does that. Have you trusted him? Are you one of his disciples? Let's pray. Father, would you help us even this morning in this new day for us, remind us of how near the empty tomb is behind us. Thank you for the brief moment to go back and visit it again. But Lord, we want to be, we want to acknowledge the way that Matthew even wrote, Matthew 28. It's a clear account of what happened, and your intent, Lord, was not that we would stay there and set up shop and set up camp and invite the world to the empty tomb. Your intention was that in seeing it, we would take off running. Father, would you help us to do that even again today afresh? Help us to take off running into our families, into our workplaces, into our schools with the gospel. Father, bring even someone this morning into the life of one who has not trusted. Help us to run and even look now before we leave today for those who might not have yet trusted your son. Help us to run and make disciples. We need you, Christ. We love you. Thank you for being our all-powerful king, our ever-present king. And it's in your great and exalted name we pray. Amen.